Faculty, students, and guests, I can think of no name in the human sciences which is associated with greater respect and reverence than the name of Eric Fromm. Coming to this country in 1933 after having completed his training at Heidelberg and the Berlin Psychoanalytic Institute, Dr. Fromm has taught and worked at a number of universities and institutes in America. At present, he is head of the Department of Psychoanalysis at National University of Mexico and professor of psychology at New York University. Not only have his writings and teachings received the attention of behavioral scientists, but also of the layman. For here we have a man deeply cognizant of the human situation, the loneliness and isolation of man in his society. I am proud and honored to present to you Dr. Eric Fromm, who will speak on the subject, Psychology of Nationalism. Dr. Fromm. Thank you, Professor Lyles. Every man is a political man in Aristotle's sense of a son politicon. Every man lives in a group, has to be related to the group, and has some feelings, attitudes referring to the group. Of course, how he is related depends a great deal on the kind of group he is living in. We see that primitive man living in clans is related only to those who share the same blood. Different was the relationship of the member of a Greek city-state to the other free members, other members of this state. That is to say, those who were free and not the slaves. Another type of relationship was that of the Roman citizen, the Civis Romanus, who felt part of a world empire. Again different was a relationship of a member of the Renaissance city st uh, cities, uh, state in Italy, of Venice or Florence. And the most recent form of uh, group belonging, group sentiment, is that of nationalism. I say the most recent referring to the fact that rationalism, nationalism as we know it today is essentially the product of the French Revolution and was from its very birth connected with the idea of freedom, independence, and the rights of the citizen to express himself rationally and freely. <clears throat> uh, you might say that modern nationalism comprises various aspects. One, a specific sentiment of belonging together with those who share the same language. There are exceptions to that which are obvious, but by and large, they, uh, this uh, definition still holds true. Secondly, the idea that these people who share the same language are organized in a sovereign state which represents them. And I should like to emphasize that by the concept sovereign, as it, is, as it exists, we must refer to the fact that the state has a right to defend its interests regardless of any rules, legal or moral, which are above the state and could restrict his actions. And thirdly, this sovereign state representing the members of the same nation is also unified by a common economy. Uh, the state supports the economy as the economy supports a state. And in the larger conglomerations, this leads to the fact that the large sovereign states and the large nations develop a great deal of physical power, that is to say, of military power, which they may or may not use according to what to them seems to be the best interest of their nation. <clears throat> These three aspects, the uh, communion of people talking the same language, and sharing the same history, 
the uh, political aspect and the economic military aspect are characteristic for the modern state and the feeling which refers to it, that of nationalism. And it seemed after the First World War in 1918 that nationalism had a, or, already reached its peak by especially the creation of a number of new nations or national states which were to a large extent due to uh, President Wilson's concept of national freedom and independence. However, those of us and uh, few of you who were uh, aware of the political events of 1918 would have dreamt that this was by no means the peak of national development. Today we see that it is not only the small nations of Europe, but small nations or even newly created nations all over the world for whom nationalism in the threefold sense which I used is the ideal, that which they are striving for. Unity of those who have the same language and sometimes who don't have the same language. Unity of those who have the same history and sometimes who have no history at all. And the, the expectation that all this will lead to the industrialization of this new uh, entity, the nation. Now, there is no doubt that there is a great deal of positive values in this new nationalism. Uh, if we call, if we mean by nationalism, perhaps better a feeling of love or interest and concern for one's nation, then of course the values of this sentiment are clear. It's a value of freedom, of independence, of responsibility, of concern. And uh, obviously, most people who speak of nationalism use the term in these positive aspects. I'm afraid that the time does not permit me to talk about the positive aspects, but I shall try to talk about the psychology of nationalism in its negative aspects. Nationalism not meant here mainly as love for one's nation, but as something for which jingoism would be one extreme expression. Or let me say that kind of nationalism, which should not really be where the love for one's nation is in contrast to the love for humanity. If you want uh, an analogy, it's just as you have some family feeling sometimes, love for one's parents, which exclude the love for men. Sometimes you find men who love their parents so much, or their mothers, that they don't even love their own wife. Well, that is not the right kind of love, either in personal relations and in the relations to one's nation. Therefore, I shall talk about nationalism today only in this second and somewhat negative and, as I think, dangerous aspect. And since I'm a psychologist and I am supposed to speak on the psychology of nationalism, I hope you will bear with me if uh, I speak as a psychologist and talk about the psychological roots in a language which may sound perhaps a little technical at the beginning, but I hope uh, it will turn out for most of you not to be too technical. The concept about which I shall talk, and first with regard to the individual, later on trying to show how this refers to nations and groups, is a concept which was, although not first, but mainly used by Freud in his system of psychoanalysis, and that is a concept of narcissism. N-A-R-C-I-S-S-I-S-M. I, -S -S -I, -S I, I uh, don't mean to, uh, this is no reflection on your knowledge, but I have found out that the word narcissism is, by and large, still one of those words, the spelling of which causes considerable uh, uh, let us say, differences of opinion. 
Now, what Freud, why Freud uses used this word is uh, uh, quite simple. There is a Greek legend of a beautiful young man, Narcissus. Uh, and there was an uh, equally beautiful girl, Echo, a nymph. Echo had fallen in love with him, but he didn't care and he didn't respond because he was sitting all day looking at his face in the mirror of the lake. And he was so preoccupied with looking at himself that eventually he, fall, he fell into the lake and drowned. Now, this is the sad fate of a man who gets enamored with himself, and this is why Freud used the word. Now, to give first the general picture of what is meant by narcissism, I can describe it in a very simple way, and that is that for the narcissistic person and I shall explain this in the course of the lecture in a more concrete way. For the very narcissistic person, there's only one thing which is real, and that is his own subjective experience. My thought, my fear, my sadness, while the world outside, while if one isn't insane, is real in the sense I see it. I see that you are sitting there. but. If I am a very narcissistic person, you have absolutely no weight. All I am concerned now is with myself, with my lecture, with my feelings, and not with you at all. Now, leave, let me give you now some examples which will clarify that which I expressed in a somewhat general way. The best example for a very extreme form of narcissism is one which every mother knows and which students of psychology know, and that is a newborn infant. The newborn infant has no interest whatsoever in any body or anything outside. And any mother who thinks that the two weeks old infant loves her uh, is rather uh, misguided, let us say, or rather unrealistic. What the newborn infant is concerned with is hunger, thirst, coldness, and it doesn't even perceive the mother as a person over there, but really the mother is simply part of his own system, which is the system of one's own needs and concerns. Well, we all know that and take it for granted, and of course it's not a pathological phenomenon. It's a normal biological phenomenon. The example for narcissism as a pathological phenomenon, that is to say for extreme narcissism, is one which is fortunately known to very few of you, again, except students of psychology, and that is insanity. This is one of the great discoveries of Freud, that he discovered that what is the essence of insanity, of psychosis, of craziness, if you don't want to use scientific nomenclature, is that for the insane person, the outside world hardly exists. In fact, let us say in many cases of insanity, it even puts out of function our sensory perception. A person has a delusion, a person hears voices, and Subjectively, he hears, and yet there is no sound, there are no voices. Because for him, the world outside is without color, without weight, and all that exists for him as reality is he himself, his feelings, his fears, his desires. <clears throat> There's a, a joke, which is a rather good joke, of what is the difference between a neurotic and a psychotic. The psychotic says, two and two are five. And the neurotic says, two and two are four, but it worries me. <laughs> well, this is as good a definition as you find it in any textbook. Because for the psychotic, there is no reality in which two and two are four. There's nothing that worries him, because his reality is how he feels subjectively about it. 
while for the neurotic person, that is to say for most of us, more or less, uh, there are all sorts of worries, but we are sufficiently aware of the reality to recognize the distance between what is real and what bothers me personally. Let me give you one example to make it still clearer of narcissism with regard to one uh, mental illness, to one form of insanity, which is uh, not infrequent as insanity and rather frequent as uh, half insanity. Uh, and that is paranoia. Let me try to be very concrete. Assuming I uh, feel that uh, some of you don't like me, don't like my views, will dislike my speech, and I'm worried about it. Well, in that case, I'm a little neurotic. But I still know that's all right. That is reality as one has to expect it. But assuming I suffer from paranoia, then I'm not any more worried that you may dislike me. I'm convinced that all of you, or some of you dislike me to the degree that you want to poison me today. And then I figure out, this is an excellent occasion, here's a glass of water. I don't know where it came from, but I'm sure it wasn't watched by the police or uh, by anybody. Uh, so there was a very simple occasion to put some poison into it and uh, to poison me, and nobody uh, couldn't be found out who poisoned me. Now, uh, is that logically possible? Yes, perfectly. And in fact, paranoia is the only insanity, which form of insanity, which does not conflict with the laws of logic. Logically, it's perfectly possible that this happened. Is it realistically, substantially likely, or even practically speaking possible, except logically? I would say no, because Experience with reality tells me that this is much less likely than having an automobile accident when I drive home. So on this basis, I drink the water. <laughs> now, what is the difference between a person who suffers from paranoia and a person who does not suffer from paranoia? It is simply that for the person who suffers from paranoia, his own subjective feeling that others dislike him is not any more checked by his sense of reality. He takes that which is logically possible for that which is realistically likely or to be concerned with, and therefore you cannot argue with him because reality does not have much weight for him. He is so impressed by his own desires, hates, fears, and whatever it may be, that that is reality. They made a very interesting experiment in one uh, veterans hospital uh, where they brought two men together, each of whom had the illusion he was Jesus Christ. Now, they thought it would be interesting to see how these three men will react to each other and somewhat to the surprise of everybody, none of the three was the slightest bit bothered by the fact that there were other two who had made the same claim on the contrary. They were all kind of decent and friendly men, and so everyone felt compassion with the other two who were so misguided to uh, think that they were Jesus Christ. But there was not the slightest doubt but of their own role because, again, like in every uh, psychotic person, reality has no weight. Uh, while the rest of us, I hope, <laughs> are aware that uh, of the difference between my feeling, my thoughts, uh, the person who is extremely narcissistic is not aware of it. His feeling and thought is reality and therefore there is no argument because he's not impressed with reality. Now, uh, these are extreme examples. Let me give you now a few examples which all of us experience. One is an example which uh, any professional man experiences quite a few times, especially if he answers his own telephone. 
Uh, I have experienced it quite a few times. Somebody calling me up and uh, saying he wants to have an appointment with me. And I say, as it as the case may be, that I'm sorry I cannot make it that day or tomorrow, but a few days later. And the man who calls up says, but doctor, I live only five minutes from your office. And I say, well, that's all right, but that doesn't change the fact that I just don't have time today. And he goes on arguing that it's so simple, it's only five minutes difference. Well, in that case, I have already made an important diagnosis. Namely, that I have dealt here with an extremely narcissistic person, very sick and likely to be psycho near psychotic or psychotic. Why? Because that person was not able to distinguish between his reality and mine. If it is easy for him to come, my reality doesn't exist. That means it's easy for myself to come. You find it sometimes the same thing, even more frequently, among people who fall in love with somebody. Let us say a, a very narcissistic boy falls in love with a girl and she doesn't respond. Now, it's very difficult for him to accept the fact that she doesn't respond. His logic is, if I love her, how could it be that she doesn't love me? And in some more pathological cases, nothing she can do will convince him. He will then have all sorts of rationalizations that her parents don't permit it, or if he knows something about psychoanalysis, he will say that her very rejection proves that he loves him so much. And, uh, well, you can prove almost anything with or without psycholytic theory. But the whole point is, he cannot distinguish, like in the case of the man whom I just mentioned, between his reality and her reality. If he is in love, she is in love. Because, in reality, she doesn't exist for him, except as a symbol upon which he transfers his own reality. There is a joke, which many of you probably know, of a writer who talks to a friend, and after having talked for 15 minutes about his latest book, he says, really, I talked so long about myself, let's talk about you now. And the friend says, all right. And the writer then goes on and says, how did you like my latest book? Well, again, this is a milder form of narcissism. This is by no means on the borderline of psychosis, and every one of us knows such people who, if they are brilliant, are very interesting because what they have to say about themselves or their own work is interesting. If they are not brilliant, they are the greatest bores because they never listen to anybody and go on and on and on talking about their latest operation and this, that, and the other. Uh, let me give you one more example, and that is a much better known one, uh, namely... Uh, let us say, the woman who sits for hours in front of the mirror to make up her face and so on and so on. Well, uh, her only real interest is her body, her face. The world does not interest her. And there you get sometimes the kinds of beauties. I can think of one rather famous movie actress which has been quite notorious uh, recently, where to my way of looking at least, while the face is beautiful, it's so dull because there is no human response, there's no aliveness. You can see this person is shut off from the world and all she cares for is how she looks or what man she gets, which is also part of her equipment, so to speak. However, you may find the same phenomenon in people and maybe even in the same woman who has, who suffers from what you, what is generally called hypochondriasis. That is, stay from a morbid fear of being sick. She, today she thinks she has cancer, tomorrow tuberculosis, the next day a heart ailment, and all these organizations to gather funds for the fight against these ailments help a great deal to popularize the cause. And she's always concerned with being sick. Now, on the surface, it sounds as if that is precisely the opposite than the woman who is so vain. But in depth, it is the same. The hypochondriacal person is just as concerned with himself as a very vain person is. Only 
the one is concerned in what one might call a positive sense, the other person is concerned in a negative sense. Uh, I just want to make one last distinction about narcissism in general, and that is a distinction between benign and malignant narcissism. By benign narcissism, I understand the person, the narcissism which a person has who is proud of something he has done, an artist, a scientist, a carpenter, any person who does something and has a narcissistic charge, you might say, on his work. Well, I call it benign because by the very fact that he has a narcissistic attitude about his work, nevertheless, uh, he prevents himself from being fully narcissistic because being an artist, doing something, forces him and makes it necessary for him to constantly being in touch with the world. Uh, that is to say, to transcend his narcissism. What I mean by malignant narcissism is the person who is proud not of anything he does, but of himself as he is. I am wonderful. Either I'm so brilliant or I have such, uh, uh, God knows what, there are some men who fall into a real depression when they lose their hair. Uh, now, there is nothing wrong with that, but that happens in those cases in which the object of their narcissistic attachment was their hair. And when they lose it, they feel as if they were lost. Now, uh, I come to the second part of this lecture, and that is, and I had to prepare it by explaining what narcissism is, and that is of the transformation from individual narcissism, narcissism referring to my person, to what I would call social or group narcissism. If I stood here and said, look, I am the most wonderful person in the world, and maybe I would include my family, my father and my mother. We are just wonderful. The rest are dumb, are dirty, are uneducated, inferior morally. Well, you would know where to send me. But if I stood here and said, my nation, my religion, my race, my political creed are far vastly superior to everybody else, and at best, everybody else's nation and creed is, uh, uh, well, if they are wise, take us as an example. Then many people, I hope not too many among you, will think that this kind of talk is very virtuous. Uh, I would seem to be a very religious man, uh, or a very patriotic man, or a very loyal man to be so convinced of the supreme value of the group to which I happen to belong. Now, if I am a person, an individual with great achievements or great power or much money, then all my employees will laugh about my jokes, even if they are terribly stupid, because they have to, and even they're impressed by them, because a very rich man has to make very good jokes. Uh, but if I'm a poor devil, I'm poor, uneducated, I have nothing, then I have to be terribly crazy to feel I am wonderful. But if I can feel that my group is wonderful, my religion, my race, my nation, my political party is so wonderful, then vicariously, by making the group the object of my narcissism, I arrive at the same narcissistic satisfaction which I have if I am only an individual narcissist. Now today, you might say the main objects of group narcissism are nation, race, and political creed. In the, 18, in the, in the 17th century, the main object of narcissism was religion. Today, it's very difficult to understand for us how Catholics and Protestants could have suspected each other from poisoning wells, from being the, the uh, agents of the devil. 
uh, when we believe, well, there are certain differences, but the differences are not that vital. But what, uh, so today, religious uh, uh, narcissism is not so potent anymore. In fact, it's not potent at all. Maybe partly because religion is not so potent anymore. But what is potent today is nationalist, racial, and political narcissism. Uh, and there is another, uh, in other words, the feeling my group, whatever it is, is uh, the most wonderful one. And what you find is, in fact, that the groups which are the poorest one, economically and culturally, in any country, are the one who show the greatest, most intense group uh, narcissism. Uh, I shall take an example, not from the United States, but from Germany under Hitler. It is a fact that the groups which supported Hitler was neither the middle class nor the working class, but was the old and dying and decaying lower middle class who had been destroyed partly by the increasing development of the country's economy and society and partly by the defeat of the emperor and the loss of all those values which had been uh, connected with the imperial system. But generally speaking, you find that uh, narcissism is a one great compensation for the cultural economic poverty of a certain group, and the poorer the group are, the more it compensates itself for by the feeling, I, belong, I am great because I belong to the most wonderful group, whether that's called whites or uh, Americans or Aryans or something else. What matters is not the contents. What matters is here the psychological attitude of transferring one's personal narcissism to the group. Uh, let me speak briefly about the pathology of narcissism. Uh, among the pathological narcissism, whether it refers to individuals or whether it refers to groups, several can be mentioned which are very clear. One, the lack of judgment and reason. Naturally, if there's only reality for me which counts, and that is I, my feelings, my thought, I to the same degree have no reason. I do not, if we mean by reason, the capacity of seeing the world objectively because precisely narcissism makes it impossible to see the world objectively, because I and the world are experienced into entirely different uh, forms. Secondly, of course, narcissism is the greatest contradiction to love. In fact, uh, you might say that the essence not only of Christianity, but of all great humanist religions, Buddhism, Christi the prophetic Jewish religion, uh, Christianity, uh, all could be formulated, this essence could be formulated as meaning overcome your narcissism. Love, as the Old Testament says, your neighbor and the stranger, and as the New Testament says, and love thy enemy. There is no greater expression of overcoming one's narcissism than the love of the stranger and of the enemy. If I love the stranger, then indeed I have overcome this strange phenomenon, which so often is plainly pathological, and that is of giving undue importance to myself. Now, the most uh, dangerous pathological symptom of narcissism is the wounding the, the wound afflicted to narcissism. You can see that, I'm sure, among your friends and acquaintances, and I hope not among yourselves, that when you have a considerable degree of narcissism, then criticism of that to which your narcissism refers is reacted to in two ways, either by extreme hostility and anger. Now, you can't always afford to be hostile, if your boss wounds your narcissism and you start a scene, you lo lose your job. 
so when you can't afford it, there is a second possibility, and that is a reaction of depression. It is as if you were completely deflated, as if you were nothing, because uh, you felt yourself very strong only in this inflated narcissistic way. And if that inflated balloon is punctured, you are nobody. Because one is somebody only to the degree to which one is interested in the world, to which one relates to the world. If I'm only for myself, I am nobody. And the narcissistic person is only for himself. Now you find the same phenomenon among groups. Any very narcissistic group has not only this pathological overemphasis on its own group values, but it shows all the traits of fury and rage and destructiveness when anybody criticizes it. It tends to feel that others are no good. I am wonderful and I have no mistakes and uh, no, no uh, shortcomings. And this is actually greatly helped by a mechanism which psychologists call projections in which I project all my defects on somebody else. And so the enemy is all bad and all, I am all good. For instance, I think that happens to a large extent when people get so excited about the godlessness of the Russians. I think any religious person, genuinely religious person, will have to agree that unfortunately we are rather godless, in fact. That is to say, religious feelings are not an effective motivation for our actions. So, uh, from a non-narcissistic standpoint, we would be quite uh, concerned with our own spirituality, with our own, if you please, godlessness. But if we can project the whole problem that we don't feel the values which we profess are real and effective on, in us, in ourselves. If we can project all that to the enemy, then of course we are safe. Everything is fine. And we can continue with a narcissistic picture of our own perfection. Now there are actually two uh, thoughts or two movements which counteract narcissism. One is a truly and a true and authentic religious attitude. And secondly, it is science in the modern sense. Because a scientist can be a good scientist only if he is highly self-critical, if he does not over-evaluate his ideas because they are his, in fact, if he's constantly busy to criticize his own ideas. Now, we should think that both the religious and the scientific development in Europe would have contributed greatly to diminish our narcissism. The fact is, as we all see, it hasn't. Religion has often become a source for a narcissistic attitude toward one's own religious group, and science often has become to a narcissistic pride in the results of science, and that is technique. And I'm afraid a good deal of our education is not truly scientific education, but technological education, in which our pride is that we can travel to the moon soon, or that we can even produce things which can destroy the whole human race. Uh, I think this is a very serious problem, and that unless we make a new step, we are in danger of losing the great uh, achievements which the human race has made in the last 2,500 years and which Europe has and America has made in the last few hundred years. I think we must critically appraise our own ideas, our own attitude to ourselves and to the group to which we belong by becoming aware of those narcissistic aspects which falsify our judgment. Uh, that we must arrive at a, cons a new concept of humanism you, as it runs through from the Hebrew prophets, the Christianity, Renaissance, Enlightenment, to men in our day like Albert Schweitzer or Einstein. Humanism which has always said that each one of us carries within himself all of humanity 
Each one of us is a sinner and a thief and a murderer. Although we don't act that way, but each one of us is also a saint and a good man. And as Terence said, there is nothing human which can be or should be alien to us. Uh, I think we are confronted with this alternative. Either we attempt to live up to what we preach, or we will eventually deteriorate by the narcissistic worship of ideologies and of the machines and gadgets which we create. This cannot be fulfilled, in my opinion, by a nostalgic return to the 19th century, because never can any society return to the past. I think it can be achieved by looking forward and by trying to achieve a revitalization, or if you please, a renaissance, of those values on which our whole culture and society is based, and that is on reason and on the humanistic attitude towards our fellow man. I think what can save us from the worship of new idols, namely that of race, creed, a nation, and technical gadgets, is indeed only a new humanism and a new rationalism, which, however, differs from the rationalism of the 18th century by not being naive, but by being utterly realistic, if you please, cynically realistic. And that indeed, that such a revitalization would result in a paradoxical blend between faith and utter realism. Thank you.